What you are seeing here is the soul of Africa. I grew up in Africa, I was born in Africa, raised in Africa, and Africa gets into your blood. There's no way that you can ever get rid of it. You can take someone out of Africa, but you cannot take Africa out of anyone. And if a visitor comes here, he can experience the beauty and he can drink in the character. But it's not the same as having been born and raised in this country. Every single person that I have met that has left this country has this inner yearning, this something that is built into the very fiber of everyone that is born here. It reminds me of heaven, I think. Everybody on this planet has a yearning for something. If you listen to those sounds in the background, and all of us have actually been translocated, in a sense dislocated, and everybody longs for a restoration of that which we cannot define. Now, if you read the scriptures, you find that there is talk of a new heaven and a new earth where everything will be restored as it was originally. And when we speak about heaven, then we say, we want to go home. Now, the closest we can get here is what we see and experience around us. So here I grew up in this, in this country. I was an evolutionist, I didn't believe in God, and all I saw was what you see. But somehow it is dislocated from you, it is separate from you. It is like being in a movie and you are seeing things that have transpired. But if you know that God actually created all of this, and that this is but a faint remnant of what it used to be like, well, then something awakens in the soul which, which an atheist can never ever appreciate. I always used to believe, you're here, you're gone, you're history. But now there is, there is something more, there is, there is a, a hope of something greater, something even better, something even more beautiful than this. And can you imagine with these sounds around you what it must be like? It must be phenomenal. Henry, you say God's timing is always perfect, right? Now, ever since the corona catastrophe, we have not been able to travel. And uh, this whole question of how should one travel with all the new rules and regulations and all of these things. And now, here you are sitting in Africa, and uh, <laughs> we are sitting and having this conversation. 
what inspired you to make this trip? How did it come about that you decided you're going to come to Africa to come and visit us? See, you just mentioned living in Corona times is difficult. Not only for those ones that are possibly affected by whatever, whether that's a job or whatever, but also in the travel world. Yes. And looking back to my own life where I have traveled like six months per year, leaving my dear wife at home and being out there shooting movies, documentaries, whatever it was, I came to the point that um, because I have decided not to go the track the majority of people did in Corona, I live in Sweden. And uh, my last trip is more than two and a half years ago. That means I haven't touched my passport since there, since that time. It was in my shelf. But for some reason, the idea popped up. Lord, will I ever see Walter and his team again? And I felt there is a, a need, a burden on my heart. To speak boldly, we need to speak about a future, about working together about creating something that touches the heart of the people out there. We have to reach, we have to yeah. reach the world with your final it. message. The Lord is coming soon. That's it. It's a big and problem. You make everything available there is. And I was moved by the idea of Clash of Minds sharing everything they record in these very entities for free. I think that's an excellent idea. And I wanted to get hold of it and maybe bring in some ideas I have and see how it could work. And I gave you a call and I said, could I come? But I said, how are you going to fly? Yeah. And I said, um, I received that thing and I got a so-called recovery certificate. So you, ha you actually had Corona. I had Corona. You were sick. I was sick. I had headache for uh, a day and a half in the nights. I had a little bit of cough. That was it. Okay, I was a little bit more sick than yeah. that, but I also recovered. Yeah. My wife uh, was sicker. She had a problem for like two weeks or so. And so I'm very yeah. happy with my natural immunity. <laughs> oh, very much so. <laughs> yes, very much. That is true. But I thought, okay, since I have that recovery certificate, I can may as well just fly and see Walter and Martin and Fanny and the whole team. But it's only Sweden that gives you a recovery certificate. Europe does if you have a certain number and if you have done a PCR test, which I needed to do in order to get, if I had a positive test, to be recovered, so to say. Okay. So we did that and it was positive. Oh. A red line in my report. So, okay, I'll send it to my friend in Germany who has a pharmacy and who deals with these numbers and he was allowed to apply its recovery certificate for me, which I got digitally. And then I downloaded the app and then applied the number to it. And it was connected to, what is it called? Robert Koch Institute or something. Ah, yes. That was official. Absolutely fine. Okay. And it lasts for six months. And so, oh, ready to go. Here we go. I took my passport, went to the airport, and I received the mail saying, you have to have a Negative PCR test. They said positive. So it can't be. It so should be a negative PCR test to enter South Africa. And I read that on Sunday morning, 11.30, my flight was supposed to go at, at 7 o'clock p.m. I said, what am I going to do? I don't have that test. What am I going to do? And so I said, Lord, you must help me here. And we figured out, is anything open to get a PCR test? So we ran down to Gothenburg, which is a more than a two hours drive to Gothenburg Airport, and then it says, four hours waiting time to receive your test result. That would be beyond my check-in time. It would be already like I would be in the air. But yeah. you cannot check in with having a negative PCR test. So I said, okay, we'll fix it somehow. I said, Lord, you must help us now. Before we went in, we prayed. We went in there. One hour and 15 minutes later, I've got the result. Can you imagine? Unbelievable. And I had a written statement, came by email, went to them, printed it out because naturally I didn't have a printer. And I took it along. I said goodbye to my wife and I flew. Before I went in the aircraft, the lady said, can I see your passport? Of course. And she checked out and she went through. You know, you traveled a lot in past times. So it's packed with stamps and visas from all over the world. And there was, there was a 
not enough space, really, but the passport has 32 pages. And she looked at it, oh, you're so lucky. Your last page is free. Looking at the, uh, uh, you know, entering South Africa, it should be fine. No problem. Lufthansa. So I said, okay, if you're sure, yes, you can fly. Okay, I came to Joburg, went to the immigration department, and a lady got the passport she went through. She said, I can't let you in. I said, why? Because we expect you to have a double page free of your passport. So I didn't know about that. So one page is enough. It's the last one, 32. Can you use that? I said, no. And she had, didn't hesitate for a second. She took me along, said, follow me. And she went into some holes in the background, and she came to an officer, and he showed him the passport. He looked through, and he said, wait next door. There's a room, waiting room. I waited, I waited, and I saw my next flight would be going. Only two hours of a de delay, like layover. Yes. And um, he wouldn't move. So I carefully went out, knocked at the door. Hi, my flight to Hützbret is going. Is that okay now? Can I have my passport? And he pushed it aside and said, with that passport, we're not going to leave you in. You're not going to let me in the country? No. So well, what does that mean? You can fly back straight back to where you come from. So you're kidding. No, true. I'm not going to let you in. So he called his boss and he said, hey, there's someone. And he explained the story to him. And the boss said, send me a picture. So the guy opened the passport and took a picture with his phone to send it to the boss. It took again half an hour for him to respond. He did not respond. I went in back to the guy, so he called him back and said, hey, the guy is still waiting. What's your answer on him? Chuck him out. What? You have to leave the country. And the guy, another guy was sitting in the corner playing with his iPhone. He got up. I'm preparing for papers for, to leave South Africa. I said, you can't do that, guys. So I went down, sort of very low on the, on the level of him sitting at the desk and said, guys, isn't there another way? I was really kind. I mean, I came here. And, no. So I went there and said, Lord, you can't. What is it? What is it? You don't want me to enter here after all that stress and the PCR test? And I called you. And you were, you were shocked. You couldn't yes, believe Yes, I was shocked. And I said, well, if they're going to send you back and you came all this way, uh, if God wants you to be here, then he will open the way. If he closes the door, then we must accept it. And I said, we'll pray. And you phoned my wife. What, your wife. And she phoned our group back there in Sweden. Everybody prayed. They were just in a prayer time anyway. And I said, okay. And I went over, I looked at him, and he filled out my papers for the returning flight, sending me back to Lufthansa to fly back to Frankfurt. And I said, Lord, if that's really happening, okay, I have to accept it. All of a sudden, I see him coming out, doing some copies of the passport, coming towards me, saying, come on, hurry. The same person. Come on, hurry. I said, what do you mean? Come on, hurry. You can enter the country. I said, what? I, said, I couldn't believe it, but he's joking. I said, no, no, come on, come on. He took me, really. He took me on his arm, ran out, went to the immigration with all the boots there, and he said to one of the guys, and even a lady in a wheelchair was before me, he pushed her aside. He went to the guy, said, let him in. And the guy looked through carefully. That was his job. said, I can't let him in. And said, put in the stamp. And the guy looked at him and said, no, I can't. It's not legal. And the guy said, put in the stamp. I have spoken to the boss. He said, I want to speak to the boss. He has a meeting. Put in that stamp now. I looked at these guys. They looked at one another for a few seconds. And he lifted up, put it in the machine. On a page that has already been occupied. He gave it to me. I said, God bless you. God bless you for what you've just done. I said, it's all right turned around and left. Now, what's the probability of that person being an angel, speaking with absolute authority, saying, put in that stamp? There is a great chance. Sure. So the fact that you are here is actually a miracle. It is a huge miracle. So maybe, or not maybe, surely we must prayerfully consider or what the future is, and what God intends for us to do, 
and what he intends to do with that information. Let me assure you, we will announce that to the viewers of Clash of Minds a time soon to come. I hope so. May God bless you. Thank you. Would you want to close for us in prayer? Yes, I'd love to. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we could talk about what connects us, that is you. It's all honor to you. As you have provided and you will provide as we're coming to the end of this earth. Lord, looking back, so many miracles happen in our life. And we want to look back, not to forget how you led us. Help us to overcome everything that is disconnecting us from you. Help this ministry, Clash of Minds, to walk forward in faith, to help the viewers out there and each everyone who is listening May their heart be touched to what they heard today and in future and make a final decision for you soon coming. In your wonderful name, amen. Amen. Megana re kauja ro kopane tsene bone re papa tsa re bolela mahatsi ya ka re tsene What you are seeing here is the soul of Africa I grew up in Africa I was born in Africa raised in Africa and Africa gets into your blood There's no way that you can ever get rid of it. You can take someone out of Africa, but you cannot take Africa out of anyone. Everybody on this planet has a yearning for something and everybody longs for a restoration of that which we cannot define. So here I grew up in this country. I was an evolutionist. I didn't believe in God. And all I saw was what you see. But somehow it still has an inherent message. It still has some beauty that no one can explain, that you can only experience. and that this is but a faint remnant of what it used to be like well then something awakens in the soul which which an atheist can never ever appreciate i always used to believe you're here you're gone your history but now there is there is something more there is there is a, a hope of something greater something even better something even more beautiful than this and can you imagine with these sounds around you what it must be like it must be 
phenomenal. And if you look at all these creatures and you marvel at the tremendous variety we find in nature, then it comes to mind that once upon a time, I believed that all of these creatures and everything that exists here were just a circumstance of chance. As a committed evolutionist for many, many years, teaching the theory of evolution at the university, it is hard for me to think like I used to think. How do you convince a committed evolutionist that everything we see and touch and feel around us is not a product of chance? I grew up in a home where we had two religious views. My father was a Roman Catholic. My mother was a Lutheran. And my mother was dying of cancer. And I was a little boy and I was constantly informed that it was a very unfortunate situation that she not having the right faith would be confined to the fires of hell for all eternity. Well, that made me turn totally against God and I rejected the entire view of God and by the age of 10, I was a committed atheist. Later when I came to university and I studied biology, and majored in animal physiology in the Department of Zoology. The theory of evolution supplied all my answers. I was a convicted evolutionist. Africa is a place that shows a pulse which you find nowhere else in the world. Here in this often arid world, in this world of contrast, you find masses and herds of creatures that, that bring out something in humanity that nothing else can do. I started off, of course, as a Darwinist, believing in gradualism, because most of the staff at the university where I studied, the University of Stellenbosch, were convicted Darwinists and believed in millions of years of evolution, powered by chance mutations over many, many eons of time, and then sorted by natural selection. I went on many field trips, and there were, there were basically two views. And one of the groups within our department was more neo-Darwinistically inclined. In other words, they believed in punctuated equilibrium. And so this, this led to heated debates within the department 
As to whether evolution was a slow, gradual process or whether it was punctuated by rapid periods of evolution, tachytili if you like, that's what they call it, or whether it was a slow process which they termed braditili. And these debates were a constant reality. When we went on field trips and you saw these marvelous fossils in the Karoo, these all entrenched the theory of evolution, but the exact methodology was very fluid. Was it a slow process? Was it a rapid process? Now, why did they come up with the idea of a rapid process in the first place? Well, because the intermediary fossils, which are supposed to link the various groups together, they don't exist in the natural environment. And if you go right to the beginning of the macroevolutionary process, then all the organisms are there at the same time. All the phyla are there at the same time. So there must have been an explosion of life on this planet. Almost an instantaneous appearance of all the various life forms. Now, this doesn't gel with the older model of gradualistic slow progress which would leave a long chain of evidence in the paleontological record.
And I remember many a time when I came to a classroom that students would confront me. You see, Africa has a very religious soul. And there are many, many people in Africa who believe that God created this universe in all its variety, in all its beauty. To me, this was something which I could not even dream to entertain because I had a very hostile image of God. I have had this image of this wrathful deity who couldn't wait to destroy and obliterate you whenever you made a wrong move. And particularly a deity that said, ha, chose the wrong religion, off to hell you go forever and ever and roast there for all eternity, I'll sort you out. I had no, I had no room for, for such a deity. As in most cases, you throw the baby out with the bathwater. You weren't willing to entertain different aspects of the deity, as we were willing to entertain different aspects of the theory of evolution. And I remember sitting or giving a lecture once to first-year medical students. First-year medical students are, are chosen for their ability. You, you don't get into the medical school un, unless you are an A-grade student. You have to be very capable to get in in the first place. And to think that these capable people actually believed in a, in a God, a living God, that was something that I, I couldn't even dream to entertain. And I was, I was lecturing on the kidney and, of course, describing the structure of the kidney, which is actually an incredible organ because all these, these Malpighian bodies, the loop of Henley, all of these structures are, are so intricate and so complex that it boggles the mind how the evolutionary process managed to put something like that together in the first place. But I would take it right from its very primitive origins and link it together in a logical chain until we got right up to the mammalian kidney. And as I was explaining the phylogeny, the evolutionary process, a young girl got up in the class and she said, excuse me, doctor, I don't believe a word you're saying. I believe that God created the kidney. And of course, uh, my scientific integrity was being challenged and this brought out the very best in me. And so I ridiculed this poor young lady until she collapsed in a pile of tears. And when I got back to my, my department, I thought about myself and I thought that, that that was not a very nice thing to do. But she had touched a raw point. And I wondered whether I had crossed the line.
Circumstances in my life, to make it short, had come to a point where I started thinking or entertaining the idea that there might be a God. Now to me, the Bible was a book of myths. It was a book of old stories told by old men who imagined the various aspects of the biblical story. But the deeper you go into it, the more intricate it becomes. And the Bible is not just a book which pretends to have historic facts about origin and about history and the period of Abraham and the nation of Israel and conflicts between nations and naming kings, uh, on which level it has been challenged many, many, many times. But the spate of the archaeologists seems to have continuously and constantly substantiated what the Bible had to say. But when it comes to prophecy, this is a totally different, different field altogether. Prophecy is history written in advance. And if you take the book of Daniel, and it describes the kingdoms of the world right down to our time, and the higher critics would say, sorry, that must have been written after the event. And even the you know, modern scholars will say, well, this book, maximum second century, but even then, even if you take the second century BC, they would be in, in major trouble because the final events surely took place much a long time after that. But the book is written in Aramaic and the book is written in Hebrew and they found snippets of the Aramaic, and the Aramaic comes from Persian period. In other words, the dialect that was used there comes from the Persian era. So that authenticates the book as round about 600 BC. Amazing that the entire history of the world have been written in advance. And then the details of Daniel chapter seven, they totally overwhelmed me, particularly from the religious background that I came from, where the powers that will be active in the last days are described in such meticulous detail. And the reformers picked up on this and they based their entire theology on these prophecies, which were irrefutable. And I remember going to the university library trying to find some evidence that, that this was all concocted, put together by some genius. But alas, history substantiated what the Bible had said. And so I became convinced, well, if there is prophecy, then there must be an intelligence behind that prophecy.
And if there is an intelligence behind that prophecy, how far back can I take that intelligence? Can I take it back to Genesis chapter 1? And then the study of Genesis chapter 1 started to intrigue me. And I began becoming involved in particularly the genetic aspect of evolution. Because this is a major bone of contention. Millions and millions and millions of years of accumulated mutations bringing about the life and the sounds that we hear around us. A very conversive little bird over there. In any case, you see, evolution, natural selection does not operate at the level of the genotype. Everything that happens at the level of the gene has to come about by chance because natural selection can only deal with reality. This, this stump is a reality. How did it come into existence? An animal is, an, is a reality. But the genes are just letters putting together a story in a book. And until they are transferred into the actual reality, natural selection cannot get a hold of it and, and decide which one is the fitter or which one is the less fit. So everything at the level of the genotype works by chance. Now what is the probability that a gene could come together purely by chance? And of course, I have a visitor coming to visit me. So if everything at the level of the gene happens by chance, how did the first gene come into existence? Well, the molecules would have to come together and form this DNA macromolecule without the enzymes, which are encoded within that, that piece of DNA in the first place. So what was first, the chicken or the egg? Did the enzymes come into existence and then the DNA? Well, you cannot have the enzymes if they're encoded in the DNA. And what are the probabilities? They are mind-boggling, mind-boggling. The numbers are so enormous that we could say one to the number of particles in the entire universe is the probability of just one simple gene coming together. And what about the millions and millions of genes that have to be generated purely by chance? And then they have to be manipulated and changed by mutation in order to bring about all the variety that we see around us. What do you, what do you personally think about the idea of going across that river? Not a good idea. Why is that? Because it's way too deep. I think it's it is. much deeper than my air intake. And if it sucks in air, my engine's gone. Hmm, decisions, decisions. This river crossing is exceedingly deep and my vehicle's in air intake is, is not that high. It doesn't have a snorkel. Do we go across or do we take the long way around 110 kilometers of sandy soil, which is very hard on the engine, very poor roads, where you could get stuck as well, many times maybe. What are we going to do? And that's Andre, very confident as always. Well, I don't know if the insurance will cover this, but we should make it. And just before we went through here, another vehicle got stuck. Another 4x4 four four vehicle. And, uh, well, do we risk it with a very expensive car? Decisions, decisions. Well, what did we do?
there's these little sand grasses, these hornbills, there's a squirrel running around in the back. Hopefully no lion in my back over here. And where does all this come from? Did it develop by chance? And then the intricacy of the replicating process. It is such a complex process. I mean, students have to sit and steam to try and understand just the very basics of this mechanism. Nothing that this world has ever designed, from the most intricate electronic equipment to the most fascinating vehicles, even comes remotely close to the complexity that there is in just the genetic replication. These are design structures so complex that it takes the greatest minds in the world just to get a glimpse of the intricacy. How we long to understand that process. And when the genes are transferred to make greater variety, it is not a haphazard process. It is a precisely designed activity where specific enzymes cut the gene at precisely the same and correct locus and clip it out and transfer it to another position, slot it into a position where it is red. <laughs> Thank you for that commentary. I agree with you. <laughs> so, how does this come about? I mean, imagine going up to a, a rocket scientist who has just designed the greatest self-propelling structure that, that mankind has ever seen, computerized with all its intricacy, and saying, well, that's a marvelous stroke of luck that this thing came into existence. You'd, th you'd think you're, you're crazy. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. But not just once, over and over and over and over again. It just is improbable. Improbable is not the word. You would have to escalate that to the power of 10 billion to say that these things came about by chance. do not even understand the mechanisms and the functioning of one of its cells, let alone how the eye came into existence, or even, even greater than that, how the, the computer program that analyzes the images in the brain came into existence, that fixes the pictures. All of this speaks of a, of a magnificent design. Well, if there is a magnificent design, then by implication, there is a magnificent designer. I came to the conclusion that there must be a designer. We had a discussion class, an evolutionary discussion class at our university. And I made a list at that stage of about 10 questions which seemed to pose a major challenge to the general evolutionary way of thinking. And I put these 10 questions, one after the other, on the board, and the result was phenomenal. There was such anger in my colleagues, such fury, which eventually blossomed into, into 
open antagonism and hatred. But it struck me that the theory of evolution is not just an issue of scientific debate, this is a religion. People cling to it because the alternative is too ghastly to contemplate. And the alternative we're speaking about, of course, is God. Because if you had an image of God as I had an image of God, then evolution to me was a far more comfortable way of dealing with reality than having to come face to face with this deity particularly if the image we have of the deity is one of contempt and hatred and wrath and anger. And uh, I mean, if, if I look at the great scientists of the world, Dawkins, for example, he has the same idea. He hates, he hates God the way I hated him. He writes in his book, The God Delusion, about the character of this deity. And I, I come to the conclusion that neither he nor I had the slightest inclination or the slightest idea of what the character of this, this God must be like. I've had many discussions when I was an evolutionist with people who stood for creation and I found them rather ridiculous because I had been established in my paradigm, I'd been trained in my paradigm, I was efficient in my paradigm and I wasn't going to let anybody rock my boat. So how did it actually happen? that uh, I would even entertain the idea that everything we see is not a product of chance. Well, of course, if science cannot convince you, then there must be other means. One of the great movers in my life that, that changed my, my way of thinking was prophecy. Prophecy is, is incredible. Prophecy is history in advance. 
And when I studied the great delineations of, of prophecy, particularly in the context of the, of the battle the between religious systems on this planet, I came to the conclusion that if the prophetic word is so accurate, particularly the prophetic word pertaining to the ministry of, of Jesus Christ, for example, that maybe the rest of the Bible is, is not so ridiculous after all. I came into, into contact with people that, that were very knowledgeable when it came to biblical prophecy. And I tried to, to convince myself that, that these things were not real. And I would go to the library at the university and test them. And eventually found out to my dismay that the prophecy and the recorded history were in perfect harmony. The leap, however, from prophecy to the acceptance of a literal creation is, is quite a substantial one. And how does one cross that great divide? Now, obviously, if you believe in the evolutionary theory, then everything is millions and millions and millions of years old. And the Bible says in six days, God created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And six days and millions of years are certainly not compatible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But worse though is that this scenario is even fixed in his law, in the Ten Commandments. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. And then it lists all those that were not to work. And then it says, for in six days the Lord created the heavens, the earth, etc. Now, this is even a commandment and it pertains directly to the creation. Now, there are many people in the world who are theistic evolutionists. So why not, why not go that compromise route? Well, there are certain theological challenges when one gets to theistic evolution. In theistic evolution, the days become long periods of time. Well, the whole of the creation week is then out of sync. The fourth day would provide the sun, but the plants would exist in the third day. And if you make that millions of years, it, it just doesn't seem compatible. And uh, the other problem is that the marine mammals were created on the fifth day and the land mammals on the sixth day. And if the marine mammals were derived from land mammals, well, then we are a couple of million years out of sync. So there are all kinds of problems associated with that, purely on a scientific level. Of course, when it comes to the religious level, then the problems become even greater because in the evolutionary theory, death is the means whereby survival of the fittest ensures a, a better gene pool for them to continue in their future endeavors. So uh, what do we do about that? Death, death is part and parcel of the package. Whereas in the scripture, death is a consequence of sin. And then the whole, the whole issue of salvation and Christ and the death of Christ to, 
to overcome death and to say, death, where is your sting? Well, if death is part and parcel of it, and Christ had to die so that we should not have to die, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. According to the scriptures, we were created to have immortal lives, and death was a consequence of sin, and salvation in Christ is the solution to the sin problem. So theologically, theistic evolution doesn't make sense. Purely on a scientific basis, it doesn't make sense. But a literal six-day creation, did that make sense? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth.
I was, I was in a sense blessed that I got into contact with people who were rather knowledgeable in these fields and I had many opportunities to go out into the field and verify some of these facts for myself. And I've come to the conclusion that for every argument, there is a counter-argument. If there is an argument in favor of long periods of time, then there is an equal argument in favor of short chronology. And, and that incorporates everything. If you want to take a scenario of uh, a chest full of gold somewhere uh, buried by some pirates on some distant shore and every year the wind and the rain comes at a particular rate and washes away the, the surface levels and after a number of years there the chest starts appearing then you would be applying the principle of uniformitarianism and saying well this is how much disappears every year, this coin that is in this chest is of such and such an age, therefore so much layer had to be removed per year in order to expose this chest. That would be one way of doing it. But what if you had a mega storm and in one single day, what normally would take years, removed all the topsoil and the chest was exposed, then that which normally would have taken a long time happened in a single day. And so catastrophism supplies many, many answers which normal geological processes or, or in the normal geological time frame cannot explain. And there are many examples, canyons that are V-shaped, which depict rapid washout, uh, massive destructive uh, conditions like waterfalls, the Columbia River Dry Falls. These were all catastrophic events that shaped the environment. Is it possible that a universal flood shaped our planet and created it such as we have it today? Well, the Okavango Delta is an interesting place because surrounding it we have paleo lakes, ancient lakes that depict that there was lots and lots of water, probably from glacial origin and uh, does this take a long period of time or could it be short chronology? Well, standard geology tells us it takes a long period of time, millions of years and more than one age, ice age following one upon another. But uh, you could do the same in a rapid chronology because if you look at modern glaciers, the way it, and the rate at which they recede tell us that glaciation can be complete in a few hundred years. It doesn't have to take millions or hundreds of thousands of years. So there's always an argument and a counter argument. So my point today is, can we with science alone address this question? Or is this question more than a question of science. Is there a God? And if so, what is the character of this God? Well, according to the scriptures, this God has taken the trouble to reveal himself in a particular person. And that person is Jesus Christ. Now, if you ask him, what does this God look like? He says, you have seen me, and I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So we can get an idea of the character of God. But we can also see that in this character that we see in the face of Jesus Christ, we can also see the other side, a massive conflict, because after all, he was crucified. He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. And so we have this, this image of a conflict between two forces. So either this planet is a chance occurrence, or it is the stage of a naked war 
between good and evil. And the more I look at this planet, and the more I see what is happening in this planet, and the more we study history and see the cruelty of man towards man, then we come to the conclusion, or at least I have come to the conclusion, that there is good and that there is evil. And this conflict is clearly described in the scriptures. And the question is, well, where do I stand in this equation? Look at some of the stories in the Old Testament, some which typify judgment, and we conclude that God is a hard taskmaster. But in actual fact, the one who healed the people, the one who made the blind to see, the one who made the lame to walk, this is the deity that we should be looking at. He was no pushover. He had principles, he was firm, but he was kind and gentle and generous and long-suffering. All the attributes of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you would find in this one individual. And if you come to a right understanding and you add the character to the same deity that is depicted in the Old Testament, uh, then you, you come up to a challenge, a disconcordance in the brain. And until you have meshed them and understood that justice and mercy carry equal weights and that the cross did not negate justice and it did not elevate mercy above justice, but it combined them into a singular reality. Justice and mercy kissed each other. Then you have, you have the picture of a, of a deity who is just and in control and can, can govern his government. But at the same time, he is kind and gentle and approachable and loving, then justice and mercy merge one with another and you have a deity who is strong but gentle. 
all combined into one. He will by no means let those who transgress his precepts get away unpunished. But if you repent and you come back into harmony with him, then there is an abundance of forgiveness, an abundance of grace available to you. So I had to change my, my view of God. I had to get rid of this old concept of this wrathful deity and replace it with these gentler concepts. And if you look at nature, you see both entrenched in nature. You see the regality and the power and the strength in a lion or in an eagle. And by the way, the Bible uses those images to describe God. But you also see the gentleness of a deer and the softness of the eyes in the other creatures. You see the humor when you hear some of these sounds. I mean, who, who could design the sound of a donkey? And the amazing thing about a donkey is once he starts singing his song, he has to complete it. And who cannot smile when you hear something like that? Or when you see a baboon climbing in a tree? Or when you see um, them gibbering and chattering with each other? Who cannot smile when they see something like that? Is God a stern taskmaster? Or does he have a sense of humor? Look at the animal kingdom and you will have your answer. And so slowly my concepts changed, fired and fueled by the prophetic word that there was a consistency, that there was a reality, that there was a deity. I cannot explain where he comes from, but he doesn't do that either. He just says, I am. Sometimes I yearn for the capacity to show the face of God to people. Like that bird twittering on that branch over there. If you can read God's character in that bird, then that is the image one would want to bring across. And there's so much suffering and so much pain. And, and what relief would be found in the knowledge that there is a God who cares, not only for that little bird sitting on that branch twittering away, but for each and every single one of us. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the whole world knew God? Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello Walter. Hi Martin. Are you doing well? Martin, the question has been repetitive over more than two years and the answer is always yes, even if it's not. 
Well, you know, it depends on what we mean, like we've mentioned before, with are you well? Yes, if you ask someone how are you, and they answer you want the long version or the short version, then you know you're in trouble. That's it. <laughs>